Now on to today's event, which is again entitled Exploring the Patterns and Impacts of Diet and Nutrition Among Older Adults in the CLSA, presented by D Dr. Jacqueline Hurley and Dr. Rachel Murphy. So I'm going to do a quick bio of each of our presenters. Uh, first, Rachel, Dr. Rachel Murphy is a scientist in cancer control research at BC Cancer and an assistant professor in the School of Population and Public Health at UBC. She holds a PhD in nutrition and metabolism and completed her postdoc training in epidemiology at the National Institutes of Health. Her research program has focused on the role of nutrition in the prevention and control of cancer and the etiology under, underlying lifestyle cancer and relationships. Dr. Jacqueline Hurley is an assistant professor in the School of Kinesiology and Health Sciences at York U. Her area of expertise is musculoskeletal biomechanics, where her research interests include investigating mechanisms of musculoskeletal injury and developing effective exercise rehabilitation strategies for chronic uh, conditions that commonly accompany age, including osteoarthritis and rotator cuff pathologies. Now I will pass it on to our pr presenters and I uh, believe uh, Rachel's going first or I could have that wrong. <laughs> Dr. Hurley's presenting first. All right, great. All right. Let's share my screen here. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm very grateful to uh, have the opportunity to speak in this webinar series today and, and share some of our CLSA research investigating diet and nutrition risk and their relationship with mobility and general health in older adults with osteoarthritis. So I wanted to begin by acknowledging my wonderful uh, co-authors and collaborators on this project, uh, beginning with Dr. Monica Malley. Uh, so Dr. Monica Malley is a, an associate professor at the University of Waterloo and extensively studies musculoskeletal biomechanics and osteoarthritis. And so the work that I'm discussing today uh, was, um, was work that I conducted while I was a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Malley's lab. So I'm very excited to be able to share this exciting work. Um, that we researched during my time at McMaster, as well as uh, the University of Waterloo. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Emily Wiebinga, who is Dr. Malley's research coordinator and project collaborator, as well as Dr. Heather Keller, who is a professor at the University of Waterloo and an expert in nutrition and aging. I also wanted to note that the research I'm presenting today, so our background, our methods, our results discussion, as well as our tables and figures have been published in the Journals of Gerontology Medical Sciences, so the full citation can be listed there. So I wanted to start off by briefly talking about osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis, or OA, is the leading cause of chronic pain and lower limb disability, and it affects the knee most commonly. It is a degenerative disease affecting internal joint structures, notably cartilage, and it impairs work productivity and longevity, it also increases the risk for a variety of different chronic health conditions, including cardiovascular disease and depression. OA is also extremely prevalent, so it affects one in eight Canadians and does increase considerably with age. It is higher in women, uh, particularly over the age of 50. Now this number is expected to dramatically rise, if not double in the coming decades. Now, surgery is the most successful treatment, but uh, the resources showing below have reported that greater than 190,000 patients were eligible and, and willing for surgery, but didn't receive it. And, uh, you know, this would probably be speculating, but I suspect with, with COVID, it would probably be even more. Um, and this number is expected to rise, if not double, um, within the next 30 years. So therefore, it's critical to determine some effective non-surgical interventions that allow us to reduce the painful symptoms and functional deficits in uh, osteoarthritis. It's also expected that one in five Canadians will be overweight or obese by 2024. And a relationship does exist between obesity and OA. And so the literature has shown that overweight and obese individuals are actually at 2.5 to 4.6 times greater uh, risk of having the osteoarthritis. And so this data was from uh, the meta-analysis of a systematic review uh, that show that the risk of OA is increased 35% um, with a five kilogram per meter squared increase in body mass index. And so this risk of OA related to obesity can be attributed to several different factors, 
um, such as higher mechanical loads, uh, so a greater body mass, uh, would cause you to have greater loading on those vulnerable compartments of the knee, um, as well as physical inactivity. So this can go both ways as um, physical inactivity can elevate our risk for OA by a reduced muscle mass or um, poor muscle quality, but also a painful, uh, a painful OA joint may reduce our ability or willingness to exercise. There's also different pro-inflammatory processes which have been associated with uh, increasing pain and worsening function. And so there are several different interventions such as uh, diet and exercise interventions, which may yield improvements in both obesity and OA related symptoms. So a randomized controlled trial that investigated both diet and exercise among overweight or obese individuals with OA um, actually showed that by reducing body mass by 10%, uh, this was related to improvements in physical function. And so this was by Dr. Messi and colleagues. Um, but Dr. Malley, among others, have conducted uh, several research studies focusing on exercise for knee osteoarthritis and have demonstrated these improvements in pain and self-reported function, mobility, performance, and strength. And so we also started to become interested in studying different aspects of nutrition and how that might affect uh, OA-related symptoms. Uh, specific food intake may affect OA with, uh, again, research showing that better quality diet may be associated with better mobility performance. In this case, um, mobility performance was measured using a chair rise test. And then dietary fiber was also related to a lower risk of symptomatic knee OA. And the suggested pathway here um, for this relationship was the effect of fiber on reducing body mass index, which would subsequently then affect those inflammatory processes that are related to uh, disease development and the risk of pain. And so a lot of the diet trials in OA are typically very strict. Um, so the uh, caloric intake wouldn't necessarily reflect one that we might uh, consume regularly. So we started to think about uh, nutrition risk as nutrition encompasses attributes other than the physical food being consumed. And so nutrition risk screening um, allows us to examine the behaviors related to uh, nutrition and malnutrition. And nutrition risk wasn't uh, evaluated in OA. So the purpose of this research was to examine whether aspects of diet and nutrition risk relate to physical capacity and general health in older adults with osteoarthritis. And so we hypothesized that consuming more high calorie snacks, consuming lower dietary fiber, as well as being at higher nutrition risk would be associated with poor mobility, grip strength, and uh, self-reported general health. And so for this, we used uh, data from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And so we specifically used baseline data from CLSA participants recruited for a collection of the comprehensive database. Um, both qualitative and quantitative measures were captured in adults 45 to 85 years. And the data for analysis uh, for the sample was collected between May 2012 and 2015 uh, through both face-to-face at-home interviews and at data collection sites. We also had a number of uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. So for the inclusion criteria, we included participants that were between 45 to 85 years at baseline, and they would need to self-report a diagnosis of hand, hip, or knee osteoarthritis by a physician. And so the question in particular was, has a doctor ever told you that you have osteoarthritis in the of the hand, of the hip, and or of the knee? We also had a number of different exclusion criteria um, that reported there, I, I won't read them all out, but essentially we are looking more at uh, neurological and respiratory conditions, as well as an incomplete data set. And so we, um, uh, any participant that had missing data for any of our independent or dependent variables um, were excluded from analysis. So starting with our independent measures, so we evaluated certain aspects of diet um, using uh, select questions from the short diet questionnaire. And so this was classified with the variable NUT or NUT. And so specifically we were looking at question one, which asked about high fiber cereal intake, and then questions 25 to 28 uh, that looked at high calorie snacks. And so there wasn't a specific question asking about high calorie snack intake, but instead, um, question 25 looked at ice cream, ice milk, frozen yogurt, milk-based desserts, 
Um, question 26 was more salty snacks, so chips and crackers. 27 was um, cakes, pies, donuts, pastries, cookies, and muffins. And then 28 was chocolate bars. And so what we did was uh, they were asked to record the number or the number of servings and then the unit of measure. So per day, per week, per month, per year. And so we combined the high calorie snacks into one single independent variable uh, labeled our nut HC or high calorie. And then high fiber cereal was a separate independent variable and again classified as nut FBR or nut fiber. We also evaluated nutrition risk. And so this was evaluated using uh, the modified screen to uh, abbreviated tool. And so again, this is uh, one of the questionnaires uh, within the uh, CLSA database. And this was uh, developed by Dr. Heather Keller, who is one of our co-authors. And it is an 11 item questionnaire that asks participants about several different behaviors related to nutrition. And so specifically, we'll ask about changes of weight. Uh, so compared to, um, compared to six months ago, it asked if they gained weight, lost weight, or stayed the same. It would also ask about how much weight they lost or gained in the six month period. Uh, it asked questions pertaining to appetite. So how often they generally skipped meals, um, how they would describe their appetite. Uh, there were also questions pertaining to physical challenges while eating. And so uh, how often they choke, cough, or have pain when um, swallowing food or fluid. And then it, there was also a question about, or a couple of questions for, pertaining to diet. And so specifically asking about fruit and vegetable consumption as well as fluid consumption. And then lastly, there was uh, some questions related to meal patterns and social, socialization. So how often you eat a meal um, each day with somebody else? Uh, do you uh, cook your own meals? And then um, asking them to comment on certain statements related to meal preparation, such as um, enjoying cooking or sometimes finding it a chore, as well as whether or not they're satisfied or unsatisfied with the quality of food prepared by others. And so um, the scoring for this, uh, participants who had a score uh, greater than or equal to 43 would be deemed lower risk. Moderate risk was between 38 and 43 and higher risk less than 38. And so I've included the, the citation here for the, some of the psychometric properties for this uh, screen two tool um, in, the, uh, in the bottom right corner. In terms of our dependent measures, uh, we first evaluated physical capacity. So physical capacity was evaluated using grip strength and mobility. And so grip strength was captured again through the CLSA using the Tracker Freedom Wireless Grip Dynamometer um, and a figure uh, from their website is shown here on the right. And uh, we chose to evaluate the average of three repeated trials. For mobility, um, we used a pooled index of four different mobility tests, including uh, a four meter walk, so this was the total time to walk a distance of four meters, a one-legged standing balance, so the best attained time for standing on one leg up to a maximum of 60 seconds, a chair rise test, so the average time to rise out of a chair five times, and then a timed up and go, which is the time to rise out of a chair, walk three meters, and then return to the chair to the seated position. And so instead of looking at these four different mobility tests independently, um, we chose to create a, a mobility index where a higher mobility index equaled better mobility. And in both cases, a higher grip strength and a better mobility uh, would represent better physical capacity. And we also evaluated general health. And so um, we evaluated the total score of three questions pertaining to general health. Uh, with participants being asked to rate their general health, their mental health, as well as their own healthy aging as excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. Um, and again, the uh, a higher score here would, would represent better general health. We also chose uh, to include a covariate center analysis that we believe might impact um, physical capacity and general health in OA based on previous literature. And I have a, a list of those here. Um, one that we did include as well at the bottom was OA type, where there were seven different classifications. So in this case, we looked at those who had hand OA only, hip OA only, knee OA only, and then the combination of the two and the combination of, of the three. For our analysis, we conducted several linear regression models to study the relationship between uh, independent variables and covariates uh, with each of our dependent variables. And so we first um, 
analyzed a covariate model where we examined all the covariates that were described in the earlier slide with each of our three dependent variables. We then conducted separate models for each of our independent variables, again, after accounting for those covariates, and uh, ran a likelihood ratio test to determine whether those models were statistically different from that covariate only model. And so one thing I just wanted to point out on this slide is you could see that I have four different uh, uh, independent variables. We have our, our nut HC, which is our high calorie snack intake, our nut fiber, which is our high fiber cereal intake. But then we chose to look at the nutrition risk score, as well as the nutrition risk classification, where they're grouped into uh, those at low risk, moderate risk, and high risk based on those classifications that I described earlier. Now, looking at some of our results and starting with participants, so from our initial sample of approximately 30,000 participants, uh, 7,900 um, roughly met the inclusion criteria and 3,700 after the exclusion criteria. Uh, now, our final sample size used for analysis was uh, 1,404 because those are the participants from this sample that had a complete data set and some information pertaining to the participants can be seen here. Now, starting with uh, grip strength, so our covariate model was significant with older age, female sex, uh, greater depressive symptoms, and lower income related to lower grip strength. But for grip strength, neither of our dietary variables uh, nor the nutrition risk variables were shown to be significant. For mobility, again, our covariate model was significant. But here, our uh, nut fiber, as well as the uh, nutrition risk score, were shown to be significant with greater fiber intake and lower nutrition risk associated with greater mobility. So again, as, as hypothesized. Um, but neither the, um, the high calorie snack intake or the nutrition risk classification was significant. Now, there was a moderate effect size, despite not being significant, um, between our low and our high uh, nutrition risk classification groups with a uh, higher nutrition risk classification, again, associated with lower mobility than that uh, lower nutrition risk classification group. And then lastly, in terms of general health, again, the covariate model was significant. Neither of the dietary variables were significant, um, but our nutrition risk uh, score was significant, again, with higher nutrition risk associated with lower general health. This figure here shows again our nutrition risk classification, which again was significant, where we have um, general health index on the y-axis, uh, our nutrition risk classification on the x-axis with uh, the green representing a low nutrition risk, uh, moderate in that sort of yellowy orange color, and then high nutrition risk in red. Um, above that, uh, you'll see the statistical differences as well as the effect size. And um, you see there's significant differences between low and moderate nutrition risk and low and high nutrition risk, where higher nutrition risk was associated with uh, lower general health. And so overall, nutrition risk uh, was significantly associated with both mobility and general health in uh, hip, knee, and or hand osteoarthritis. And these findings do support um, previous literature that's examined uh, the quality of life among frail um, seniors that have shown that uh, higher nutrition risk has uh, reduced our self-reported uh, physical health in this population and it's been associated with functional decline. Also, the intake of uh, examined dietary items were not significantly associated generally um, with physical capacity or general health, with the exception of higher high fiber cereal, which was related to better mobility. And again, um, this supports previous literature that showed that fiber can reduce adiposity and inflammation, which again are associated with uh, pain and OA. And then certain uh, covariates and comorbidities uh, explained a large amount of variance in both physical capacity and general health. I did also wanna mention a few study limitations. So first, um, we did not provide a, a comprehensive diet analysis, but rather chose to focus on two areas, um, including uh, high fiber cereal and high calorie snacks. But certainly um, there's other aspects of diet that could have uh, attributed to both physical capacity and general health. Also, you may note there was uh, several participants excluded due to missing data. 
Um, but I wanted to note here that uh, we did run separate samples for each of our dependent measures. Um, so where they would have different sample sizes among, among the three different dependent measures, and there were no changes to the results. And then lastly, there were other potential factors that could explain variance in physical capacity and general health. For example, other diseases or conditions that would be linked to poor health outcomes among aging adults with osteoarthritis. And so the primary take home message of, uh, of this work was that nutrition risk is important for older adults with osteoarthritis, uh, where it demonstrated that these behaviors surrounding nutrition are important contributors to both mobility and general health in OA. And so these results offer some new potential suggestions for conservative nutrition-based um, uh, interventions to improve both physical capacity and uh, health among older adults with OA. So I wanted to thank everybody for their, uh, for their attention today, again, for being invited to speak here today. And uh, again, to my co-authors, as well as Dr. Stratford and Dr. Gaddy for providing statistical support, as well as our research support. So the um, Schlegel University of Waterloo Research Institute for Aging, where Dr. Keller is a research chair in nutrition and aging, as well as uh, NSERC for the discovery program for awarding a, a grant to Dr. Malley to support operating costs and then CIHR again for providing postdoctoral support for me during my postdoc. And then again, obviously to the, to the CLSA. So thank you very much. And I, I think questions are gonna be deferred to the end so I can pass it along to, uh, to Dr. Murphy to, to share her work. And I will stop sharing my slides here. Thank you so much. And yes, yeah, so we will pass the, pass the torch on to uh, Dr. Murphy. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much uh, also for the inv invitation to speak today. I have a longstanding interest in, in healthy aging and disease prevention, although uh, more recently I've, I've been focused on cancer prevention. Um, I actually completed my fellowship at the, the National Institute on Aging in the US. And one of the things that attracted to me to that fellowship at the time was the ability to work with some of these leading epidemiologic aging studies in the US. Um, so when I first learned uh, about CLSA was when I was starting to move back to, to Canada after my postdoc, and I was really thrilled that there was going to be a resource like this um, within Canada. And the work that I'm presenting to you today is actually some of the first that I undertook when I started my uh, first position at UBC. So I won't spend much time on the, on the rationale for studying healthy aging, given the audience today. But very briefly, over the, the past 100 years, life expectancy in Canada has continued to increase in men and women, although it is flattening a little bit in more recent years. So the average life expectancy is around 82 years with some variation, um, especially provincially. So for example, in BC, where I'm based, there is one of the, the highest life expectancies of the Canadian provinces. However, the increases in life expectancy have not been equaled by increases in disability-free life expectancy. So this table shows findings from the US, so the numbers differ slightly from Canadian figures on the prior slide, but overall you can see that the changes in life expectancy are not equaled by the changes in disability-free life expectancy. So for example, in men, if you can see my cursor here, um, the changes in um, life expectancy is about 9.2 years and the changes in disability-free life expectancy is about half of that, so around four and a half years. So what is the role of diet in life expectancy or in disability-free life expectancy? There are of course many nutritional requirements for growth and development, as well as for maintenance of overall health, so things like the musculoskeletal system. But diet also plays a very large role in many of the most chronic, uh, common chronic diseases in Canada. So for example, about 40% of cancers can be prevented through a healthy lifestyle, which includes consuming a healthy diet, maintaining healthy body weight, being physically active and minimizing alcohol consumption. Um, similarly, it also plays a large role in the prevention of other chronic diseases such as stroke, heart disease, and diabetes. So diet is also intrinsically linked to other health behaviors that are important for our overall longevity and healthy aging. So for example, body weight, alcohol consumption, physical activity, smoking, and potentially stress and sleep as well. 
This is an infographic from the COMPARE study. So this is just to provide some um, high level context on the importance of diet for overall chronic disease prevention, and in this case, cancer. So COMPARE is a Canada-wide study which aims to estimate the current and future burden of cancer due to modifiable um, uh, lifestyle, environmental, and infectious disease, uh, or infectious risk factors, I should say. So this still shows the number of cancers that can be prevented in Canada in a given year. So notably about 6,700 cases are attributable to low fruit consumption, 3,500 to low vegetable consumption. And then over here, uh, about 1,700 are attributable to red meat consumption. So despite the importance of diet, we know on a population level, Canadians largely don't have diets that align with overall recommendations for health, so such as the, the dietary guidelines, as well as for chronic disease prevention. So just some um, very brief statistics here, as I know um, many of you already know this, but about 50% of women and 70% of men have energy intakes that exceed their needs. Uh, about 40% of women and 50% of men don't meet their fruits and vegetables, um, the daily recommended intakes, uh, in this case, uh, around five servings per day. And about one in four have fat intakes that are above the recommended range. So what do we know about the relationship between diet and longevity? Uh, one of the most widely studied populations with respect to diet is in Okinawa, Japan. Perhaps you've heard of the, the Okinawa diet. I feel like it's been on, on the bookshelves um, and a lot of those popular um, dietary, um, you know, how to live the long, healthy life kind of style books. But the islands of the south, southern end of Japan have one of the highest life expectancies in the world. And they also have a very high number of centenarians. They have a low prevalence of disease relative to other areas in Japan, as well as to other countries. So this is um, a, a bar graph here, just very simply showing that the prevalence of different chronic diseases, so coronary heart disease, colon cancer, prostate and breast cancer um, in Okinawa, um, the population there versus Japan and in the US. So you can see they have a strikingly lower prevalence of chronic diseases and especially of, of coronary heart disease. So there are many possible reasons for the differences in longevity and chronic disease including genetics and overall lifestyle. Um, but the, the diet has been uh, particularly of interest among people from Okinawa because it's quite different than the rest of Japan and in other places in the world. So there's, a, as a result, been quite a considerable amount of um, study around the Okinawa diet. So unlike the rest of Japan, purple sweet potato is the main carbohydrate. Whereas um, I think when most of us think about Japanese food, we might think about kind of the staple food as being a, a white glutinous rice. So the Okinawa diet as a result, is very high in carbohydrates, uh, but it's also very high in fiber and very low in processed foods. So if you think about to what the uh, recommended range of carbohydrates and fat are in the US and Canadian diets, it's usually around 45 to 65% for carbohydrates compared to 85% um, that we see on average people consuming in um, the traditional Okinawa diet. And fat is usually uh, around 20 to 35% is the recommended range in, in North American populations. So you can see quite striking differences. However, what is known as the Okinawa diet is really more traditional diet and dietary intake in uh, younger generations is becoming increase, increasingly closer to a Western dietary pattern, which is high in saturated fat and processed foods. And this is occurring in tandem with increased body weight and increased risk of chronic disease. There are several other dietary patterns that may be associated with longevity, which have also been um, identified through demographic studies. Uh, so for example, um, it's been observed many decades ago that heart disease was lower in countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea. Um, the traditional diet there included daily consumption of fruits and vegetables, whole grains and healthy fats, so um, predominantly olive oil, as well as weekly intake of fish and poultry, beans and eggs. Um, very moderate portions of dairy and very limited amounts of red meat. So the Mediterranean diet um, is now one of the most widely recommended to, to, for overall health promotion and uh, reduction of the risk of chronic disease and, and particular coronary heart disease. Um, so I won't spend a, a lot of time going over kind of all the different diets that have been linked to longevity, but um, just to really mention, you know, this is obviously a, a very active area um, of research. So there's been some evidence around a Nordic diet um, or a caloric restriction diet. So typically around 15% fewer calories than the recommended for a given age and sex, um, which is also, also what's seen in the Okinawa diet. So collectively the evidence does seem to suggest a link between diet and longevity, 
although there are, are lots of kind of remaining questions about causality. Um, there are also very few studies in the oldest old, so those that are 85 and older, and very few studies in centenarians. And, and most of these um, type of studies in the oldest old and centenarians have been in populations outside of North America who likely have very different diets um, than the, the traditional diets that have kind of been studied. So the oldest old, those are, again, are, who are over 85, are some of the fastest growing segment of the population in some parts of the world. Um, however, few people live to this age without developing chronic disease. So it's important to understand the influence of diet on the achievement of exceptional longevity and the role, if any, on health span. So studies that characterize dietary intake in such populations will add to our knowledge base and also provide some information for our hypothesis testing. So our aim was to assess the dietary intake of a population of men and women who are 85 and older, um, who were free of chronic disease and compare their dietary patterns to adults who are 65 and older using data from the CLSA. So we hypothesized that the oldest old without chronic disease would have dietary patterns that more, more closely follow uh, guidelines for chronic disease risk reduction, such as more frequent consumption of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and lean protein. The Healthy Aging Study is led by Dr. Angela brooks Wilson out of the BC Genome Sciences Center at BC Cancer. So this is a study that was designed to study genetic factors that underlie healthy aging and resistance to age-related disease. Between 2004 and 2007, they recruited participants who are age 85 and older from the Metro Vancouver area. Um, two groups were originally recruited. They had the usual agers group who were not selected for health disease status. And they had what they call as the super seniors. So that's the term I'll use throughout my presentation. And the super seniors are those who are 85 and older. Um, the eligibility criteria for them were self-reporting, never having been diagnosed or taking medications that were prescribed for cancer, cardiovascular um, or pulmonary disease, dementia or diabetes. And participants uh, as part of the healthy aging study completed health and demographic questions at enrollment, but they were not asked about dietary consumption. And the study is not actively following participants, but they are always looking for enrollment. So I'm just put the, the email address of the study coordinator there in case you have anybody who might fit that criteria. So one of the challenges when studying the oldest old or centenarians is defining an appropriate comparator group. The vast majority of individuals in the same birth cohort as the oldest old generally do not survive to an advanced age. And those who do may have um, other limitations that negate participation in research studies. So the usual agers group from the healthy aging had aged by about 10 years by the time we were starting our ancillary study, but was still considerably younger than the super seniors. So they started, um, the, the youngest age group was around 50. So as a result, we decided to apply to use data from the CLSA since it encompasses the same geographic region as super seniors and is more likely to represent the aging population than the smaller usual agers control group. So this is the same approach that is used by centenarian studies but it does also introduce potential generational and cultural influences, which I'll, I'll mention um, in greater depth later in my talk. So for our study, we recontacted the 177 super seniors who consented to be recontacted. Um, we mailed the packages to the super seniors containing a questionnaire on demographics and dietary intake. From the potential pool of 177 um, participants, two were not interested, four were deceased, um, some had moved. We also asked about the, the development and presence of chronic disease, since there had been a time lapse between enrollment in the healthy aging study and in our group. So participants who answered yes to any of the queried incident disease questions were subsequently excluded. So that left us with a final sample size of 122 of the super seniors. Participants were asked to complete demographic questionnaires, which were drawn from the Canadian Community Health Survey. Um, we also asked um, them to uh, complete the, the short dietary questionnaire. So it was the same one as in the CLSA. So we received permission and resources from Dr. Brian Schattenstein to use the, S, uh, the SDQ that was developed um, for the CLSA. So the SDQ, um, and I won't go into too great a depth because I think some of you might be familiar with it. And Dr. Hurley also described this as well. But briefly, it assesses usual consumption frequencies in the last 12 months of, of key nutrients and foods that are important for health promotion and chronic disease prevention in younger and older adults. So it has been tested for use in community dwelling adults. 
um, and it's been validated relative to uh, three 24-hour dietary recalls. Um, but notably, questions about portion size are not included in the SDQ. So we use data from the CLSA um, subset of 30,000 individuals are also known as the comprehensive cohort. So these are the, the participants who underwent the face-to-face -face interview questionnaires, which included dietary assessment. Um, baseline data was collected over a three-year period and completed in 2015, which is slightly earlier than our data, which was collected at the beginning of 2017. So data was obtained from CLSA participants with dietary information and covariates that were similar to those that were collected on our study. We confined our analysis to, uh, to CLSA participants who are age 65 and older to provide a comparative group of about 12,626 older adults. And we did not apply any additional exclusion criteria to the, the CLSA data set. Because we were interested in overall dietary intake versus single nutrients and foods, we used a principal component analysis to reduce the 36 item SDQ variables into a smaller set of variables and to identify dietary patterns. The factor loadings represent the relationship of each food or food group to the underlying factor. Um, two dietary patterns were identified through the use of scree plots. So we identified a pattern that roughly followed the, the Western dietary pattern. So the strongest loadings are shown here. So there were things like processed meat and red meat, French fries, sauces and gravies, um, fried potatoes, as well as high sugar snacks and butter. The other one followed more of a nutrient rich dietary pattern. So there was higher consumption of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, fish, um, as well as salad dressing. Um, so each participant was assigned a factor score for a given dietary pattern, and then they were grouped into quartiles. So participants in quartile four of a given dietary pattern had the greatest tendency to follow that diet. We then used multivariable logistic regression to calculate the odds ratios uh, for being a super senior. So quartile one was the reference for each dietary pattern. Our model one was unadjusted, and then the change in coefficient method was used to identify significant confounders. And you can see the, the ones that were included in our, our model two here. Um, we did not um, adjust for age in our models since there's minimal overlap between the super seniors and the CLSA group. So this table shows the demographics of the CLSA and super seniors. Um, not surprisingly, super seniors were older, so it had a mean age of 90. Um, both populations were predominantly white and had a similar income um, categories. Super seniors were more likely to be living alone. So nearly 64% did um, report living alone. They also had a lower um, education, were more likely to be never smokers and none were current smokers. Um, conversely, they were more likely to report habitual alcohol consumption. Um, and, and another striking difference I did wanna highlight was, the, the, was their BMI. So they predominantly had a normal BMI with only about one third reporting being overweight or obese compared to about 70% of CLSA participants. So this table shows the unadjusted and, and adjusted odds ratios for being a super senior. So the highest quartile of the Western dietary factor was associated with greater odds of being super seniors. Um, and after adjustment in model two, the, these associations were strengthened um, and, and no observations were um, observed for kind of the, the middle quartiles of two and three. Um, similarly, the highest quartile of the nutrient-rich dietary factor was also associated with greater odds of being a super senior. Um, however, those associations were attenuated when we accounted for covariates. Um, and of the covariates, smoking, BMI, and alcohol consumption had the largest impact on the effect estimates. So the highest quartile of the Western dietary pattern was associated with the greater odds of being a super senior. So this is really in contrast to our hypothesis where we thought the Western dietary pattern um, uh, would be um, more likely to be prevalent in the, the, the comparator group. Um, since this was kind of characterized by less healthy foods, so greater intake of processed meat, red meat, sauces and gravies, fried potatoes. Um, nonetheless, it's important to note that the Western dietary component also contained other factors or other foods, I should say, that did not meet our threshold for component loading um, in the PCA analysis. So things like poultry and eggs that can still contribute to associations, even though they're kind of below that statistical threshold. So our apparent uh, finding of a disconnect between the kind of the, where the less healthy Western dietary pattern 
um, the nutrient-rich dietary pattern, at least in unadjusted models, were both associated um, with greater odds of being a super senior is actually similar to some studies that we see from centenarian studies where they report that um, centenarians have a, a more varied diet, but then they may also be more likely to consume um, high sugar um, foods such as cookies and biscuits, and maybe less likely to follow nutrition guidelines for chronic disease prevention. So it's unclear though, however, whether the tendency of super seniors to follow a Western dietary pattern reflects generational or cohort differences with CLSA participants, or whether it actually truly reflects longevity related differences or possibly fatalism. So um, approaching the end of life um, and uh, kind of that, you know, I'm, I'm going to eat chocolate if I want to eat chocolate. I've already made it to, uh, you know, 85, 90 years old. Um, so the higher frequency of high fat foods may also in reflect ingrained generational dietary um, behaviors. So notably national dietary guidelines were not significantly modified until the 1980s um, to emphasize energy balance and moderation. So things like limiting fat, sugar, salt, and alcohol were really not part of the, the guidelines until a, a few decades ago. There's also potential influence of sociodemographic factors. So education was lower in the super seniors and a higher proportion of them lived alone. So both of which are associated with poorer dietary intake. And it's also important to, to recognize some of the limitations of the SDQ, which may impair our ability to draw firm conclusions here. So it's not de designed to quantify the amount of food consumed. Um, so it might also be um, prone to, of course, the, the inherent bias of self-reported um, dietary intake. And we didn't measure other factors as well that may influence dietary intake and healthy aging. So such as social factors, um, physical activity, as well as genetic variation, which would be informative to assess in future studies. So our results and, um, and our inferences are, are thus a, a little bit limited and it should be taken in um, uh, light of some of these limitations, specifically around kind of the frequency of consumption rather than amount. Um, and this is an important thing to acknowledge because total food intake does decrease with age. Um, and so this might be something that could be addressed in a future study. So finally, thank you to the investigators and the students and study team that um, made this work possible as well. Thank you um, to the investigators in CLSA for allowing us to use the SDQ in this analysis. Um, and I will stop sharing there and it looks like there's lots of questions. So that's great to see. Thank you all. Great. Well, thank you to both of you. Uh, the challenge now will be getting through the questions. So I'll try to uh, maybe start with uh, two for each of you, and then we'll we'll go from there. Uh, just to note, if we don't get to your questions, we can try to address them and get back to you um, after the seminar. Um, so uh, thinking back to to uh, Dr. Hurley's presentation. Um, the first question is: When evaluating grip strength, which differs systematically by sex, why? Why not do separate models for when men and women? Yes, thank you for your question. And, and that is a great point. I mean, to your point, we found that um, when we included sex as a covariate in the model, uh, it was significant with female sex um, related to lower grip strength. So uh, it is a great, great, uh, great point. And we didn't run the analysis differently um, or separate models, I should say, by sex. But it would be, it would be interesting to see whether there would be any reflected differences in in the outcomes in terms of um, both uh, nutrition risk and, uh, and diet. Um, and then uh, also from Jerry Lynn Pryor, who has lots of questions today, uh, was family history of osteoarthritis or joint replacement related to OA or to mobility? Yeah, also very interesting. And unfortunately, this wasn't one of our, um, one of the variables that was, was available to look at. So. Uh, we didn't look at whether family history, again, was related to each of those measures. Okay. Um, and then maybe just uh, one more quick one. I think uh, there was a note in terms of, you know, comparing uh, the, the, the results of your study to, to what's been uh, found already. Maybe you can just touch on one or two of the, the key learnings that were, uh, you know, unique to your study, or um, if you didn't end up finding um, that uh, that those new results may be um, why you think that was. Yeah, so absolutely. The, the largest uh, contribution for this research is looking at this in, in an osteoarthritic population. So there have been relationships demonstrated between, again, aspects of diet as well as nutrition risk 
um, among uh, older adults and, and again, relating it to, to things like physical function and uh, other aspects of health, but this hasn't been evaluated in an osteoarthritic population. And, you know, particularly given the, um, the prevalence of osteoarthritis and, you know, the, um, the uh, lack of uh, ability to kind of seek out surgical treatment, trying to come up with different interventions to um, potentially improve physical function as well as general health in a way is very important. And so while we've sort of looked at it from a, an exercise perspective, uh, this research contributed uh, great uh, findings regarding uh, potential nutritional strategies that we could use to, um, to try and combat uh, osteoarthritic related symptoms, um, again, non-surgically. Um, so maybe we'll go to uh, Dr. Murphy now um, for a question. What is the comparative rate of diabetes in Okinawa versus USA and Canada? In other words, does the high complex carb diet increase the risk for T2DM or type 2 diabetes? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, you know, I think intuitively you would look at the composition of the diet um, and think like what that the carbohydrates are so high. Um, that it may be problematic for, for things like diabetes, for example. Um, but that's not actually seen, that's not reflected in the um, prevalence of, of diabetes in that older population in Okinawa. So they, they have lower rates of um, diabetes. And I think it, it's also important to think about kind of, although the carbohydrates are quite high, um, there are a low, lower glycemic index carbohydrate versus like white rice, for example, it's also um, very, very high in fiber. Um, so that, yeah, that you don't see that relationship there. Um, and another question is, did you look at ethnicity of super seniors or their immigration status? What about which provinces had the most? So the super seniors are only um, in BC. So we didn't look at provincial differences. They're predominantly from the Metro Vancouver area. Um, I mean, certainly we, we'd love to be able to look at things like ethnicity and immigration status. It is a relatively small population um, because it's a, it's a very unique and um, interesting group to study, but there is only about 8% of people who reported ethnicity that was not white. Um, and we didn't ask about immigration status. What about could quality of, and this is also for you as well, could quality of protein in the Western versus healthy diet pattern potentially play a role in the association identified? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, um, you know, this was designed to be kind of a, a hypothesis generating first look at, you know, what, what might their diets even be? Because this is a really, as I said, kind of interesting, rare group to study. So we were interested to see what they were even eating without even the comparing to um, kind of the, the CLSA or the usual aging group. Um, that said, I think in hindsight, um, you know, we chose the SDQ to allow comparison to the CLSA group and also because of this, the lower burden on this population, but it wouldn't allow us to look, um, you know, at, at more detailed uh, dietary intakes so things like more of the quality of the protein and understand a little bit more of, um, you know, what the actual amounts are as well, since we were limited to frequency, but yeah, that's a, an excellent point. And I'll just maybe ask you this one last question, and then we'll go back to uh, Jacqueline. Uh, what was the duration of the diet, uh, if you collected that information? And since what age um, the diet, what, since what age was the diet followed? Yeah, um, you know, that's another important consideration. So this is um, a dietary intake over the past 12 months. So this might not um, reflect earlier dietary patterns. So things that, um, uh, so what they consumed kind of earlier in their life that may have contributed to their um, current um, kind of disease or lack of disease. Um, so a lot of the dietary patterns do tend to be quite ingrained, uh, meaning that they, they follow them a similar dietary intake kind of throughout time, but we, do, we don't know that for sure we using this single um, dietary assessment. Okay, so back to you, uh, Dr. Hurley. Um, so uh, Danielle says, thank you, Jacqueline, for the great presentation. And I think lots of our, um, our questions started with that, with that. So again, your presentations were both great. Uh, which is the estimated magnitude of the association between nutrition variables, both diet and nutrition risk and physical activity and general health outcomes? Is it relevant from an epidemiological perspective to justify intervention targeted to diet and nutrition behaviors other than being statistically significant? 
Yes, thank you. And we didn't look at, um, you know, calculating the correlation between each of our different variables, but um, I think including the effect size can certainly speak to um, the fact that they would be, be meaningful besides just being statistically mm -hmm. significant. So particularly with nutrition risk um, and general health, uh, and again, also sort of seeing these relationships with mobility, um, again, despite not being statistically significant for um, one aspect of mobility, uh, showing that there is uh, a moderate to high effect size, um, again, for, uh, for self-reported general health for a nutrition risk. So again, certainly suggesting that uh, nutrition risk and again, behavior surrounding nutrition would be important to consider um, for, uh, for an intervention. Um, and just a note for everyone, we have time for a few more questions, but uh, if you're if you have to leave a few minutes early, if you can just uh, complete the survey uh, on your way out, there's the link is posted in the chat box. Uh, and now for a question for both of you, I'm wondering if you use survey weights in your analyses. Maybe. Yeah, we well, this would... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh... So, so yeah, no, I, we did not use uh, different survey weights uh, in ours, no. No, we didn't in ours this either. It's short of three. Okay, I think we have one second. And then um, in the context of the limitations of cross-sectional epidemiology, what role do you think the method of Mendelian randomization can have in identifying causal relationships between diet, nutrition, and disease outcome risk. That's a good one. <laughs> Do either of you have a comment on, on that or have you used that, uh, that approach before? I, I haven't, I sorry, I haven't used that approach before, so I can't really speak to uh, the, uh, the effect there. Yeah, so I, I have used the Mendelian randomization, actually not in um, the context of dietary intake, but more in um, kind of um, genetic and um, phenotypic relationships with um, BMI, for example. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's interesting, and that's one of the things that we had hoped to, to look at as well in the Healthy Aging Study, because they do have, um, it was very much developed to be a genetic study. Um, so to understand kind of some of the interactions, because I think the the I mean, we were surprised to see our finding that, you know, that, that they seem to have less healthy dietary intake. Um, but, you know, it, it poses an interesting question of, you know, what's more important kind of diet versus genes versus all these other exposures and, um, you know, how do they interact? And it's not something that I think we can look at in that smaller sample size, but um, it, yeah, I think it's certainly an interesting approach. Okay, great. I think that is all of the questions. Again, if you think of any questions for either of our panelists, um, you can always email them in and we can get them to them or um, somehow either to the CLSA or to them directly. Uh, but, you know, first and foremost, thank you again to both of you for uh, taking the time out of your schedules to do this presentation. We greatly appreciate you participating in the CLSA webinar series and sharing your research. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the next deadline for data access applications is January 12th of 2022. Uh, if you'd like more information, please visit the CLSA website under data access to review what data is available, including the COVID-19 questionnaire study data, as well as details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their anonymous survey before exiting the Zoom session. We would greatly appreciate that. Uh, in terms of our upcoming webinar in December, uh, our final webinar of the year will be entitled Functional Support and Memory, a three-year analysis of, of the CLSA Comprehensive Cohort. It will take place on December 17th at noon and presented by Samantha, Samantha Yu, who's a PhD candidate in epidemiology and public health at University of Ottawa. And you can register for that uh, webinar um, at the link that is, I believe, on your slide right now. 
Um, and remember, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. Uh, we invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCB. So thank you again to everyone for attending, but also for the uh, panelists today for your presentations. Thank you.